Every week we travel the country, gaining insights into the makeup of the cities and the towns and sometimes just the neighborhoods. It may have been water power or the railway or maybe a gold strike that sparked the beginning. But each of these communities has its own story to tell. This week something a little different. We'll look at two communities thousands of miles apart. Their ancestry is similar in that in both cases, a river and the fur trade played a role. But more unique is a common spiritual theme. We'll trace the lost mission of Fort Coppell in Saskatchewan. And we'll share a day in the life of Father Richard Cadieu, a Trappist monk in Oka, Quebec. within the four walls of my newfound freedom. This is how one monk, Thomas Merton, expressed the simple meaning to his choice of devoting a life to worship earlier this century. A life where each day begins at 2 a.m. with prayer and meditation. A life which moves unnoticed away from the hype and hustle of the contemporary world a life where the strings of motivation are invisible. Father Richard Cadieu has taken that less traveled road, choosing this Trappist monastery as his adopted community. Since I was quite young, I had that feeling that I needed to give my life to God. I wanted to live a life where God was important, where God at the first place. The first time I'm, I came at the monastery here, it was in 1970. I was then 14 years old. I didn't know there was some monks in Canada. I thought it was only in Europe. After I just came two or three times a year to uh, the monastery for, let's say, a weekend or something like that. And in 1975, let's say, I asked the superior, Father Abbot, Don Fidel, so I can enter the monastery. And he told me, well, I'll speak to it to the commission and we'll see. And so I waited a bit 
and in 1976 uh, they called me in Quebec telling me that if I was still I still wanted to come in the monastery then I could enter in, in July 1976. And so, away from the crowds that gathered nearby in Montreal for the World Olympics, Richard Cadieu, alone, entered his new world. To the shores of the Lake of Two Mountains, where the Ottawa River joins the St. Lawrence, the Trappists of Bellefontaine arrived from France in 1881 to form the Abbey of Notre Dame du Lac. The fathers of Oka are past masters of agriculture, highly esteemed. Divided with the hours consecrated to their religious duties, is time spent in the fields. For me, the, the balance between the, the two has to be correct. I mean, it's not working and working and leaving God outside of your life. Or the other extreme is to say, well, I pray, I pray, and I don't work. I mean, you have to keep the balance. The Trappist skills on the land led to the formation in 1893 of a school of agriculture. From their society came an internationally renowned cheese, first produced here by Brother Alphonse Jouet at the turn of the century. To the monks, silence is the language of faith. When you enter the monastic life, your life is a life of silence. You can't just go and share anything you want, anytime, to anyone. You have times for that. The monk cho chooses silence, solitude, not for itself. So we're not choosing solitude just for solitude, or silence just for silence. But for us, it's to be able to reach God are to be open to God, simply. The humanity of those called to the order is not so different from many. For a monk, it is consistent in its demands, only softened by a faith that knows no bounds. As smoke is to the calming of the bees, so the chant is to the soothing of the spirit of a brotherhood in praise. doesn't have any problems. All he thinks that um, they don't feel anything. But I think the monk is someone that has his feelings. It doesn't mean by, because he shows a life, let's say, in chastity, that he doesn't have any more feelings. 
and he doesn't feel like having a little family or feeling like having a wife or children, I think the monk feels that also. And it's, I would say it's always there. But he accepts he accept to, to renounce to that, those type of life, not because they're wrong, not at all, because he chose to renounce it because he feels that God, God calls him in that life of prayer and silence and solitude. feel the presence of God. It's not something that you feel like the, the heat of the sun or the presence of another one near you. Usually it's in faith. We believe that God is there. We believe that God is present and that God, I would say, loves you. But it's not something that you feel like feeling the presence of another one near you. And sometimes you want, you want that God appears to you and tell you, yes, I exist and I'm here. <laughs> But it never happens. Well, never to me anyway. <laughs> I think that the monk can feel once or another time, once or another in his life, a feeling that God might not exist. And I remember myself that once I, wake, I woke up and I said to myself, if God doesn't exist, what's the sense of my life here, actually? I mean, if God doesn't exist, it's no sense gathering our ear in the monastery, praying and singing at the office, and living a life of chastity and living a life of poverty. What's the sense of it if God is not there? And I think we don't have to be scared of saying it. I mean, I'm, I, th I feel that my mon monastic life is a risk. I don't have any proofs that God exists. I believe that God exists, but I don't have any proofs. And if God doesn't exist, my life is spoiled. I mean, for me, it's very clear. But I think that my faith tells me that God exists. But I believe it. I can't prove it. Like mileposts across the Saskatchewan prairie, these giants came to signify the white man's settlement. Before their arrival, the buffalo was food and clothing for the indigenous people. The plains were the hunting grounds, the river valleys, the shelter. For thousands of years, Indians from a half a dozen nations came here to fish and to winter. Camped along a chain of lakes on the valley floor, protected from the harsh prairie winds, they listen to the spirits. South Saskatchewan's Scofell Valley has always had that kind of mystical appeal. A native, Charles Pratt, studied with the Anglican Church and established an early mission here. When he closed it, many years later, it vanished into the lore and the history of the valley. Askinuta Nichtawakiwisin was born in the Coppell 
and sent to the Church Missionary Society in the Red River Settlement to learn to read and write. Here he was baptized Charles Pratt in 1823. He was a Cinnaboyne Cree, a fiercely independent people who monopolized the trade in pemmican, dried buffalo meat, the staple of the fur trade. With the Hudson Bay Company and the Northwest Company came a social and cultural wave that would irrevocably change the native way of life. Rivalry for furs and pemmican, intermarriage with the natives, and the introduction of alcohol by the traders. Pratt discovered all this when he returned to set up a mission in 1854. Buried beneath the town of Fort Coppell today are believed to be the relics of Pratt's mission. Also in the town are the descendants of the families of Pratt's day. Of its institutions, its churches and schools symbolize what the native catechist lived for. His desire to teach the three R's and preach the word of God, his tireless motivation until his death in 1888. Pratt joined the Hudson Bay Company and learned the ways of the trader shortly after completing his studies. A number of years later, his work for the Church Missionary Society brought him back to his birthplace. Native, unordained laymen like Pratt, familiar with language and custom, were important as missionary advance men. His extensive diaries described day-to-day -day experiences, but history was not to reveal the location he wrote about until long after the mission closed. 125 years had passed when, by accident, recently, workmen uncovered the cemetery of Pratt's mission. Well, suddenly history came alive with the discovery of what had become known as the lost mission of Fort Coppell. In this Indian burial ground are what is believed to be the remains of victims of a smallpox epidemic of 1857-58. Graves have revealed both Christian and native burials, possibly indicating Pratt's missionary efforts. Sharon Giraud has studied this period. Sharon, take me back to the days of Charles Pratt. What would we have found here in Fort Capel? Um, basically, there would be very few people here at all, almost no white people. Scattered small groups of native people, and Mr. Pratt and his family. Why just small groups of people? Primarily because there was a number of diseases uh, running through the countryside, uh, whooping cough, smallpox, um, measles, scarlet fever, and the native people feared each other. And so they kept into very small family groups and um, often stayed away from the other camps because of uh, the fear of these diseases. Disease was only part of worsening conditions, pressure mounted to place the Indians on reserves. For Pratt, who would sometimes leave his mission to his children to teach as he joined the buffalo hunt, most important was the survival of his native brothers. Uh, unique things about Mr. Pratt is that he never did refer to the Indians as heathen, as so many missionaries did. Mm -hmm. But he truly believed that once the native people were exposed to the gospel and to civilization, as he, as he put it, they would embrace those things. And so um, he, he preached to them, he gave lessons, he um, taught the children to read and write. Pratt clearly saw the days of the itinerant hunter numbered. As food dwindled, he taught them that farming was the only way they could endure. The situation remained bleak. In one particular winter, they came to the Coppell River and were pulling out a buffalo which had died while trying to cross the river in the fall of the year and were frozen. And they were hungry enough to try and dig out these dead buffalo that had been there for, for months. Were the conditions any better in the reservations? Mr. Pratt seemed to feel that the conditions were worse because uh, there simply was not the food there. And in many cases, even the, uh, the horses had died so the, so the Indians could not go hunting. And he seemed to feel that those people who were still wandering the prairies were in a far better condition. Governments failed to provide food for the reserves. 
Chief Sitting Bull symbolized the plight of American Indians retreating into Canada following the Battle of the Little Bighorn. And ultimately, with the wave of immigration following the coming of the railway, Pratt's worst fears were realized. The buffalo was no more. It is said that at the time of the rebellion of 1885, he quietly led his people away from the trouble. The presence of soldiers in the area, and ultimately the hanging of the Métis leader Louis Riel, marked the final transition of Rupert's land to the government of Canada. The harsh prairie winds still blow, and people still come to fish and hunt. Nearby, at what was once called Pile of Bones, is an array of office buildings in Regina. And of Pratt? He was relocated in 1858, soon after the mission closed. Of him, it has been said, he was not a missionary of words, but of deeds. Bequeathed to the valley, the legacy of Askinutal Nichtoakiwasin. The spiritual appeal that gave refuge to the native people has not been lost. Today, Fort Capel has a dozen religious retreats, study centers. The shores of the nearby lakes are lined with church summer camps. And just as the nomadic tribes made their pilgrimage, so the population of today finds that same kind of peace. Separated by 100 years and 2,000 miles, Richard Cadieu in Oka, Quebec, and Charles Pratt in Saskatchewan. Joining them, more than a root of the original fur traders, is something shared, a faith in the same God. It'll always be home. 